in Russia, I realize you're put in jail or you're liquidated if you criticize the head of the state. But I hope the time has never come in this country that the Senate of the United States will not remain that parliamentary body in which an elected official can tell the American people a criticism of a president or anybody else that he thinks ought to be criticized. We're going to become guilty in my judgment of being the greatest threat to the peace of the world. It's an ugly reality, and we Americans don't like to face up to it. I hate to think of the chapter of American history that's going to be written in the future in connection with our outlawry in Southeast Asia. Well, he was a man of uh, absolute courage in terms of his political convictions. He has been quoted as saying, and he said it to me one day, that a politician is no good until he loses his fear of defeat. Tonight we go after the story of the most controversial man in the United States Senate. His opinions, which you'll hear in a moment, are his own and not necessarily the American Broadcasting Company's, the sponsors, Philip Morris, or my own. You'll see him there behind me. He is the Republican turned Democrat from Oregon, Wayne Morse. What does it take to please the senior senator from Oregon? Just clean government? Wait just a second, please, sir. He has gone through two presidents and he's unhappy. He's run through two parties, and he's unhappy. What does it take to please the senior senator? Just clean government, and I'm going to continue to raise this voice for clean government, whether there is a Democrat or a Republican in power, if I think under that administration there are evidences of injustices and unclean government. Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, where our legislators work... Also, give Freeman a copy of the answer. ...and play. Uh, they're going to want to strike when they have these unilateral changes in the work crews. Yeah, the they seem to be forcing it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ...continues his hearings on the proposed foreign aid program with Secretary of State Dean Rusk. represents the whole government of the United States. He's one of uh, the members of the body that represents states in the Union. And he has a right to represent any state in the Union if he so cho chooses. Wayne Mars has always done that. You feel He's a that senator of the United States. Bear that in mind. If you want to understand my political philosophy, here's the basic tenet. I think the job of a United States senator is to seek to translate in the legislation values that promote the welfare of people. Because I taught constitutional law and an advanced course in legislation for many years, mm -hmm. and I tried to get my students to see that the keystone of the Constitution is the general welfare clause. And the wealth of America is its people, not its materialism. He had great eyebrows and a tremendous focus to him. Um, when he looked at you, you felt pinned against the wall like a bug with a pin in him. And we knew, hey, we can trust this guy. He's not doing this just to get into Janet Reno's pants. I don't think I've ever met Wayne Morris's peer intellectually. I think that it was his tragedy that he had no humility, uh, very little. I had senators come to me and say, you have the most difficult colleague of anybody in the Senate. He became quite convinced that he was um, universal and uh, <laughs> godlike, some people said. He could launch the most vicious attacks against the President of the United States, against uh, his colleagues, and he didn't hesitate to do so. He started out as a Republican. Uh, and, and though a Republican voted more often with the Democrats than he did with the Republicans. When he later on became a Democrat, uh, he got into great difficulty with fellow Democrats because he would not follow 
their direction either. His first impulse was to go where he felt he should go. I happen to be, kind, be the kind of liberal that was suckered and nurtured on the liberalism of old fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin. And one lesson he taught me was that a true liberal never compromises a principle. Who is this man, the senator from Oregon? He was born and raised on this beautiful farm in Wisconsin. And though a lawyer and a teacher by profession, he has almost always lived on a farm. He grew up in a family that was part of the progressive movement in Wisconsin, which means a kind of modified liberalism. I think Morse falls into that general pattern with large deviations because he was his own man. Already when he was a student at Madison, University of Wisconsin, he just loved debating and he was good at it. And they studied elocution and how to make points and how to score points successfully in political argument. He was very uh, ambitious for recognition uh, all of his life. He was driven by the need to be recognized and to succeed. Well, he was an excellent pro professor, instructor, and teacher, one of the greatest that I ever had. And I can remember so well uh, his ability to get us to remember things that he said, some of which I remember to this day. Uh, some. 55 years later. He became more interested in things beyond the university, particularly as he became involved in, uh, in work doing uh, labor arbitration on the Pacific waterfront. Roosevelt relied on him very heavily uh, with respect particularly to maritime controversies out here on the West Coast. And I thought it was uh, remarkable. I think it was remarkable, many of the things that he was able to accomplish. And that was so important then. Those strikes hadn't been contained. We had been at a very, in a very serious fix of, of fighting a war in the Pacific when we had most of our Navy uh, under repair or at the bottom of the bay. He was uh, ferociously angry with the War Labor Board over a particular decision that they rendered, and he resigned in protest. And it was either go into politics at that moment or go back to Eugene, and that seemed like a very tame alternative. So into politics he went. Wayne Morse could come in from out of nowhere and say, I'm a candidate for the United States Senate in 1944 and beat an incumbent senator. He got up and made a speech in which he told them that he would run and he welcomed their support. But they were not to think that that financial support was give them the right to tell him what to do. He would be a United States Senator for the people of Oregon and the United States and that was that. And all these businessmen nodded to each other, boy, this is a real smart cookie. That's exactly what he should be saying. But they didn't know that he meant it. <laughs> Wayne Morse is often referred to as the conscience of the United States Senate. And very That's often, just what he is. <laughs> and very often he stands alone on certain issues, although ultimately people come around to join the position which he has taken. Wayne Morse is one of the great dissenters. And we need such men, not only in the Senate, we ought to have them in the House. We ought to have them in the legislatures of the very states. Because all the great things we have were voted down by majorities and finally had to be adopted in the long run for the welfare and benefit of the people. A dissenter is one of the great assets to the government of the United States. You may not agree with him. You don't have to agree with him. But when he's right, what he advocates usually becomes what the people want. The president did admire Morse and respect him very much. Wayne Morse was certainly from the top ranks, intellectual ranks of the country. All of those things which were the exact antithesis of what Harry Truman was and represented, yet they got along fine. They got along very well. President Truman will go down in American history as one of the great presidents of our history because this man was a man of decision. The use of the atomic bomb ought to have taught mankind for all of history 
that we have a moral duty to see to it that some way, somehow, we lead mankind to peace. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours, which has made this victory possible, to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. That's what we propose to do. 1953, the eyes of the world were on the White House in Washington, D.C., where Harry S. Truman greeted his successor, Dwight D. Eisenhower, new president of the United States. He had aspirations and hopes, probably not totally unjustified, that he might be named vice president on, uh, on an Eisenhower ticket. And I think uh, probably was disappointed when, uh, who was it, Nixon was selected. There are those who think, I have no opinion on it, that that uh, was some impetus to his eventually changing his political affiliation. He was not a team player. He was a Morse player. Being an individualist as he was, he appealed to that, those same instincts and lots of Oregonians, but not, uh, I think, to the people in the Republican Party. I came up in Wisconsin as a progressive Republican. I was brought up in the Bob La Follette tradition. I went to Oregon as a progressive Republican. I hoped we could liberalize the Republican Party. I tried hard to do it. And when it was perfectly clear that they were out to destroy me, I just left them. When he left the party, um, I think what he felt was liberation more than vindication. He suddenly didn't have to do that tightrope act anymore. He could now uh, move to a constituency uh, that uh, could support him ideologically. People say I have a low boiling point, and I do not deny it. I shall support justified expenditures for education, for medical services, for resource development in Oregon, in Ohio, or in any state. But the nation needs a low boiling point about a lot of things. I think he really enjoyed being the only one on a certain side. Uh, and I think he thought it gave him political ammunition, and I think it did. He was always giving them the, the feeling that he was fighting for their cause. And that was really a powerful weapon. And then he could always use the other side of that coin, but you're being threatened. You're under attack. You are being uh, victimized. I want to say to the building trade workers, you're the victims of a compromise because you were told, you remember, when the Kennedy Landon Griffin conference was on, that you were going to get some law in this session of Congress that would protect you and respect the situs picketing. And I can't understand how any man who claims to be a liberal could sit in the Senate of the United States and vote for a law that violates a precious legal right in this country, in my judgment, namely that right to have a uniform application of the law to all cases that fall under the same classification. He had tremendous skills of communicating a sincerity, a man of great conviction, a man of passionate conviction, and uh, people like that. Morse liked to create the impression that he was a fighter, and he, he, he was spicy. Don't forget that any city council, any state legislature, any session of Congress can wipe off of the statute books a good many of your protections, and that's exactly what happened when the Kennedy Landon Griffin Law was passed. Great rights of labor were destroyed with the passage of that law. What do I think you ought to do about it? I think you ought to fight politically. I think you ought to make clear to the politicians of this country that you want them to stop compromising principle. Principle above politics. He, he used to just irritate me, of course, as a partisan politician and as uh, someone who is responsible for the party organization. He uh, really uh, upset us privately. But then when it came to practical issues and arrangements, he wasn't our problem. You know, when you look at politics, I look at politics as basically an exercise in human relations. And human relations in any kind of a partnership or kind of a joint endeavor had to be positive to be most effective. 
And if people have suspicion, if they have reservation about integrity, if they are fearful of being mauled in any kind of a political exercise, there isn't much opportunity to establish good working relationships. When the American people discover what this administration is doing toward a trend toward economic fascism in this country by way of a corporate state, they're going to understand the situation. But despite what now, you, you said... You can't su continue to build up the economy of this country under the control of American big business as the president is doing and not have the American people come to understand its effects. His personality, I think, began to wear on some of us. Um, I remember thinking he seemed a very ego-centered person. People say he was just a troublemaker. He made a lot of noise. He made a lot of trouble for people who needed to have trouble made for them. Farm income down 7%. It's one of the number one political issues of 56. The farmers know what the Eisenhower administration has done to them. Corporate profit after taxes up 26%. Well, Senator, That's the issue. Uh, well, surely the things that your chart doesn't show and that the people really know is that they too have enjoyed this prosperity. It was fun to follow his arguments because they were logical if, if you granted his premise. And that's where you want to be very careful in debate. Because once you grant your opponent's premise, you're pretty much stuck, assuming his logic is any good. Secretary of State Dulles, in his recent New York speech, insulted the intelligence of every American by his shocking deception. This evil man bent on war must be checked if our nation's glorious record of never having been an aggressor nation is to be preserved. Dulles was too much of an ideologue, too rigid, uh, too automatically anti-communist in everything that he did in foreign policy. Wayne Morris had the right slant on Dulles. You have two strains of foreign policy, and he would usually follow one, but not always. One strain was pretty much exemplified by what I call a civil liberties concept. If governments brutalize their citizens, why the world ought to get involved and stop it. The other one is sort of a national sovereignty argument. So long as you don't invade your neighbor, as long as you stay within your boundaries, uh, we may care how, you, how badly you mistreat your citizens, but we won't do anything about it. If you're a dictatorship and you just stay within your boundaries, don't bother your neighbors, uh, why we won't bother you. Which is a much more of an old world Henry Kissinger balance of power concept. And Senator Morris was usually on the civil liberties, democracy, treat your citizens nicely side, but not always. The President and Dulles have become irresponsible men by their warmongering over the Komois and the Matsu. They have permitted Chang to move thousands of troops to the islands within a stone's throw from the Chinese mainland. They are permitting a corrupt ex-Chinese warlord to endanger the lives of American boys. He ardently felt that the UN could be the savior of uh, international diplomacy. He later uh, fell back from that and became much more a legislative soldier in the Cold War. Fellow Oregonians, I'm delighted to have as my guest on this telecast my very good friend, Senator Symington of Missouri. Senator Symington is known in the Senate as Stu. That's some indication of the great liking for him because few men are known by their nicknames in the Senate. I think we uh, should have uh, enough uh, capacity to fight a limited or a so-called peripheral war uh, so that we can fulfill our commitments to nations uh, all over the world. Well, Senator Symington, do you think it would be a fair summary of your position on defense to say that you're emphasizing the point that we must make clear to Russia at all times that she has everything to lose and nothing to gain by an aggressive course of action against the Western powers. I, I do, I do, uh, uh, Wayne. Uh, I hesitate uh, again in this field because as a member of foreign relations, you know a great deal more about it than I do. Well, Senator Simonson, as you know, I stand shoulder to shoulder with you and you're urging that we keep our defenses strong. Sometimes we hear the criticism, at least I get it, that my support of strong defenses for the country uh, may lead us into war. Of course, I reply that you've got to be strong in order to prevent war, 
And then from that position of strength, as I've heard you say so many times, we ought to offer to settle these peace-threatening issues by appeal to the judicial processes of the United Nations. Do you find anything inconsistent between my position on that and your position for strong defense, which I share? No, indeed. What we both want for our children and our country is a just and lasting peace. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. There was the constant threat of a massive invasion of Vietnam by communist China, as there had been in Korea. Remember their troops crossed the Yalu River in the Chosan Reservoir debacle? And, uh, and so there were all kinds of political, so we just sent, Eisenhower began sending aides in, and then Kennedy did the same thing. I have a choice, and it was a very difficult one, too, in connection with uh, Vietnam. Uh, there being a protagonist of the Johnson administration, uh, having supported the president in his campaign, having, as I thought, seen the American people repudiate Goldwaterism and John Foster Dulleism, we suddenly find ourselves confronted with a situation where perhaps because things have changed, or maybe despite the fact they haven't changed, we're asked out of loyalty to the administration to cast a vote for a pretty belligerent policy. I don't think we ever would have gone into Vietnam had it not been for the rampant uh, anti-communism and the assumption on our part that we had to get involved everywhere around the world where there was any kind of a communist challenge. Anti-communism ruled the day in that period. The ideology of United States foreign policy was anti-communism. If you brought something uh, before the uh, Congress, uh, in the name of anti-communism, and then you added to the fact that uh, United States servicemen had been attacked in foreign waters. Well, you must rise to the defense of the boys overseas. Mr. Johnson took the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which turned out to be fake later on, and got the Senate to pass this resolution and then he went ahead and spent a lot of money we didn't have, put us into debt, very deep debt. This is in no way a routine appropriation. For each member of Congress who supports this request is voting to continue our effort to try to halt communist aggression. There has been no proof satisfactory to many people that, uh, that the Vietnamese actually attacked that destroyer or destroyer escort. But I do not know that President Johnson knew that it had not been attacked at the time he made the request for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. And certainly nobody in the Congress would have believed that. We all sincerely believed that there had been such an attack <coughs> and that the best interest of the country and of the world demanded that that be approved. Others disagreed. Why not give the president a vote of confidence? This was the lingo of the reservation. We got to back our president. Since when do we have to back our president, or should we, when the president is proposing an unconstitutional act? And so these reservationists said that although I'm going to back my president, I've got, I want to show him I have confidence in him. I want to warn him. I'm not giving him a blank check. This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that I don't expect him to consult me in the future. This doesn't mean that the president can go ahead and send additional troops over there without consulting me, a senator of the United States. And you know I most respectfully, but used language that they understood, said that's just nonsense. I said, I want to say to my colleagues in the Senate, you're being consulted right now. War was never officially declared, but the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution uh, was considered by the president, by President Johnson and, and many, many others to be uh, uh, almost an equivalent thereof. At least it was congressional approval. Wayne Moore saw a very distinct role there of the Senate abdicating its check and balance responsibilities in foreign matters by giving a blank check to President Johnson.
to carry on the war, which President Johnson waved around in the air later on and called it a congressional declaration of war, which it wasn't. And so being a lawyer and having that great understanding of of the relationship of the conduct of foreign relations between the President and the Senate. I think that was the issue that he made his case on. Uh, I couldn't help but give a strong huzzah to Wayne Morse in his and Dr. Greening's, uh, Senator Green from Alaska's vote against the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Here are all these guys. They don't bother to be present while he's making this speech. There are only four or five people on the Senate floor and they'll come up to him in the Senate dining room and saying, Wayne, I am sorry I couldn't be there to hear that wonderful speech you gave there yesterday, but I read about it this morning in the Senate journal, and I, I'm, I, God, you're doing the right thing. I wish I could do it, but, uh, you know, it'd be suicide in my state if I were to do a thing. But you're right, keep doing it. And when they'd leave, and Wayne would sit there and nod his head and thank him. And when, when they would walk away, Wayne would turn to me and say, another self-certified coward. <laughs> and LBJ said unto Adam and Eve, of every fruit of the great society, save one ye may eat. But of the fruit of descent, ye shall not eat. For on that day ye shall surely doubt. Wherefore ye may not tune the tube under the forbidden channel of Fulbright, nor seek to understand the accursed code of Morse. If I can be more useful as uh, one who stays on the team but doesn't hesitate to say his word uh, than to break contact the way a couple of my colleagues have done and go out on an all-out attack on the administration. Wayne Morris and the late Senator Ernest Groening were right. We should have all stood up and said, we're not going to sign a blank check to the President of the United States to do whatever he chooses in Vietnam. We had the same convictions about Vietnam. We both thought it was a, a disastrous uh, mistake. Uh, we both thought that the uh, involvement of the United States was unconstitutional that beyond that it was against our uh, national interest. Senator Morris, what do you mean when you call our participation in the South Vietnam War unconstitutional and illegal? Well, our government has no right to send American boys to their death in any battlefield in the absence of a declaration of war. And Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution vests the prerogative of declaring war in the Congress of the United States. And no war has been declared in Southeast Asia and until a war is declared, it is my position that it is unconstitutional to send American boys to their death in South Vietnam or anywhere else in South v uh, Southeast Asia. I don't know why we think, just because we're mighty, that we have the right to try to substitute might for right. And that's the American policy in Southeast Asia. It's just as unsound when we do it as when Russia does it. He began talking about McNamara's war I think not because he thought that McNamara was the sole architect, but because he wanted to preserve some liaison with President uh, Johnson and with the uh, administration. But he made more of a direct attack on the administration than I did. Senator, the Constitution gives to the President of the United States the sole responsibility for the conduct of foreign policy. Couldn't be more wrong. You couldn't make a more unsound legal statement than the one you have just made. Yeah, this, this, this is the promulgation of an old fallacy that foreign policy belongs to the President of the United States. To whom does That's it belong nonsense. then, Senator? Belongs to the American people. Right, and our constitutional how, how fathers can, made it very, how can, very clear. Then how can you uh, say that Adlai Stevenson or Secretary of State Rusk or Secretary McNamara have three separate uh, foreign policies which they are promulgating in the UN, the State Department, and the Defense Department. What Where does the President fit into what this I'm in the is, responsibility scale? What I'm saying is under our Constitution all the President is is the administrator of the people's foreign policy. Those are his prerogatives and I'm pleading that the American people be given the facts about foreign policy. You know, Senator, policy. that the American people cannot formulate Why and execute foreign policy. Why, you're a man of little faith in democracy if you make that kind no, of that I have complete faith 
in the ability of the American people to follow the facts if you'll give them. It isn't and my a charge lack of against faith, my Senator. government is we're not giving the American people the facts. We are an open society. We believe in a fair, free expression of news. But on the other hand, we've got to understand one thing, that when it's critical and classified, what you tell to an American, you're telling to someone in the Kremlin as well. And there's some things that we have to keep to ourselves if we want to keep our security. But what they do let us see at the Pentagon and State Department and White House level, that's marked top secret, secret and confidential, 85% of it minimum never should have been so labeled. Just putting that label on it doesn't justify keeping it from the American people. This is the first guy from that area that stepped out and said, this is a bad war, let's not do this anymore. And uh, won himself nothing but uh, trouble there in the Senate. Wayne Morris was a warrior. Everybody who saw him knew that and who he fought for, what side he fought for, the what he did wasn't as important as him being the warrior. You think you could support an American army in North Vietnam? Well, they wouldn't have a chance. Find me the military officials, will you, that know anything about Asiatic warfare that will tell you that American ground forces can win a ground war in Asia. To take on the, the whole uh, ideology of American imperialism that had been put behind the facade of anti-communism uh, was a very tough undertaking. While he, to some extent, supported, uh, you know, dissent from and, and uh, resistance to the war, he was treading pretty carefully because if he totally isolated himself from all of the power centers in Washington, then he, in fact, would become politically irrelevant. What we don't want to face up to is that we, too, along with North Vietnam, happen to be an outlaw nation in Southeast Asia. We have absolutely no justification under international law for our course of conduct. Morse and, uh, and Governor Hatfield were, at that time, engaging in uh, many, many speeches, particularly on college campuses, as I remember, urging that uh, the, the war be stopped. And uh, I have to say that when Morris and Hatfield started out, it, it was a rather lonely road they were, they were pursuing. Protest rallies such as the Yale students are conducting ought to be multiplied by the hundreds across America in the next few weeks. The American people want the facts about their foreign policy in Southeast Asia, and they want a justification, which they have not been getting, because all they've been getting has been propaganda. And really everywhere that uh, Wayne Morris went, uh, there was an overflowing crowd. Uh, he was such a passionate speaker, and uh, we learned from his perspective, uh, and we learned from his rugged independence, really. I don't think you have any idea of the power that you exercise on issues before the Congress. But my plea is we've got to think of the future, and your future. And we've got to come to grips with the issues that are going to confront your generation. Young people, I think, wanted to learn that we wanted to be able to break out of uh, sort of the media shell at the point at that point where we were just wondering about what was going on. Of course, we certainly have no business either of misrepresenting to the American people that we're in South Vietnam to promote freedom. What freedom? When has there been any freedom in South Vietnam? What we are supporting in South Vietnam is a military tyranny set up by American puppets, starting with Jim, running through one coup after another. The other night I spent two and a half hours listening to tapes that had been taken out of Southeast Asia by a war correspondent, tapes made by American GI boys at the various battlefronts. Those tapes would make your hair stand on end. Boy after boy asked the question, what are we doing here? What are we over here for? Why don't we get a different type of support than we're getting from the South Vietnamese? He became a hero to the anti-war movement. I would not say he became uh, a hero to the public at large. There were very few uh, uh, public figures, uh, conspicuous public figures, uh, to look to in those days. Make clear to your government that you do not believe that we ought to sacrifice American boys by the increasing numbers in a civil war in South Vietnam. There was a 
mini-civil war here in the United States in the period 1966 to 1974. And that's not in the history books. I take my stand with a General Ridgway, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a General Gavin, a General Shoup, in urging a de-escalation, the falling back to lines that we can defend that will stop the killing of these boys until we can work out a multilateral negotiation for the settlement of this war. We can't do it on a bilateral basis. And so I close with a plea on my lips that the Democratic Party at this convention support a minority report that opens the door to multilateral negotiations and returns to the ideal of substituting the rule of law for the jungle law of military force. And when we practice it, then let me say we've got to make clear to a Russia for its shocking action in Czechoslovakia that we're going to hold them too to the substitution of the rule of law for the jungle law of military force. election revolved around Vietnam. If you were a passionate dove or a passionate hawk, I suppose you voted for Senator Morris or against Senator Morris on Vietnam, but that assumes that the entire state was passionate hawks or passionate doves. And you know, We were worried about timber exports and we were worried about a variety of other things. And then you had this, this, this holdover of people that were mad at Senator Morris personally. Uh, nobody had ever heard of me. I had, I think, 9% name identification. It was, I'm running against Senator Morris. He's known by every man, woman, and child in the state. I'm not. But it's interesting, as I go down, as I go down the street shaking hands, I'll say, hi, I'm Bob Packwood, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate. And somebody will say, well, uh, fine, you're a nice young lad, uh, very good. And then I'll say, and I'm running against Wayne Morris, and bam, I get the reaction, oh, oh, you're the one that's running against, oh, I'm supporting you. Bob Packwood, I'm running against Wayne yeah, Morris. That's what I want. <laughs> well, I'm, against, I'm against Wayne Morris. Racing with the roosters for an early start, Senator Wayne Morris prepares to leave his farm home in Eugene to start another day serving the people of Oregon. What will that day be like? There was a wearisomeness that had set in. The uh, vital, dynamic person had, was still vital and dynamic, but less so. And once the giant was really kind of thought, maybe it's possible to defeat him, I think there tends to set in a, a, a generated acceleration. And once that momentum starts, uh, it carries, and you have to have something pretty dramatic to reverse it. In that last campaign, Wayne was getting old. He was not the same sharp debater and advocate that he had been a few years before. Same principles, same general broad outlines of his attitude. But when this handsome young veteran named Bob Packwood showed up and began to hammer at Senator Morse, the contrast was too much. 
I like to think that a senator has an obligation other than how many dams, how many reclamation projects, how many irrigation projects, and how many jetties can I produce for my state. You're not going to find me, as Senator Morris has, making statements that Radio Hanoi is going to play to our boys, making statements, as Senator Morris has, that are showered on the heads of our troops from planes and leaflets. What Packwood doesn't want to face up to is the fact that he is trying to weasel on this matter of Hanoi and uh, Saigon and the Vietnam War. The fact is we've got to stop killing these boys. And I want to say to Packwood, are you ready to stop killing these boys? If you are, then give support to those of us that say the time has come to bring them home. All unknown challengers, and I was relatively unknown, want to debate that well-known incumbent. It gives you an equal platform. And all incumbents don't want to debate if they can avoid the debate. It is our pleasure to have with us today Senator Wayne L. Morris and his Republican challenger, Robert W. Packwood. This confrontation between these two candidates to give us a discussion of the issues is to be under a rather rigid format which was arranged by discussion with representative of both candidates. We agreed, 30 second questions, two minute answers, and then we'd each have a little time to respond after the other person answered. And so I spent hours with a professor at Portland State named Ben Padrill, who was a public speaking teacher, Democrat, a, a liberal Democrat, and Ben, Professor Padro, would rehearse me uh, in front of a television camera, just in, privately, on two-minute answers. In that debate, which was probably one of the most focused debates in a Oregon political history, Packwood was seen as fresh, young face, snappy answers. He had, he had seconds to spare in giving his answer in two minutes. Senator Morris hadn't even gotten to the core of his answer in two minutes. And the procedure killed him. I appear before you asking for your support for my reelection on the basis of my record of 24 years of dedicated service to the people of Oregon and the United States Senate. Uh, I have made it very clear that any time anyone violates the law, the law must be enforced against the violator. I want to say, however, that we do have this precious constitutional guarantee to dissent within the law. But dissenters, as well as uh, other people, must stay within our system of government by law if we're going to retain our freedoms. If we're talking about uh, the people carrying pickets, the funny-looking, uh, barefooted, beaded, uh, be beard-wearing uh, guys, they're not my cup of tea. But if they want to go up on the hills and raise turnips, or if they want to go down here to the Multnomah County Courthouse and get a permit and parade around like the rest of us uh, have a right to do, that's their business. I'm not going to stop them from protesting the war or the draft or anything else that they want to do. But when they cross that line, and when they start to say that this society is so rotten that it's got to be destroyed in order to save it, then I say stop. When I see a guy like that crazy kid at Columbia University sitting in the president's chair with his feet on the desk and smoking a cigar, I get mad. And I'd put that kook in the pokey until he's learned going to live by the laws that the rest of us have to live by. As a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, I deal with the one issue that pales all other issues combined into insignificance. And that's the issue of the war in South Vietnam and the necessity of our bringing it to an end and stopping the killing of American boys in South Vietnam into a war in which they never should have been sent in the first place. It's one of those things in politics where people call it a no-win issue. No matter which side you took, the other side was so passionately against you that and normally you lose races in politics, you don't win them, you lose them because of the people that were opposed to you. When Wayne Morris as he did seven weeks ago, can say that our aid in Vietnam is identical to the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. Then to me, that belies a misreading of foreign affairs that's colossal. Because our policy, at least, from President Johnson to Wayne Morris, is to get out. And the Russian policy in Czechoslovakia was to get in. I think we say to the Saigon government what President Eisenhower merely suggested 14 years ago. You undertake these reforms. You clean out the corruption in this government. You undertake a land reform program that will give the peasants of this country a stake in the government. 
and will stay. But if you won't undertake this program, then we're getting out. The policy is not to get out of Vietnam as far as the Dulles program is concerned. That was brought out by Secretary Rusk and those unfortunate remarks he made on the press interview not so long ago. We're there and we knew it for 30 months before that press review, but uh, our lips were sealed. We're there for a major reason of maintaining a military presence in Southeast Asia. Now as to land, to land reform, we have already turned over to the Mandarins in charge of the South Vietnamese government good many millions of dollars for land reform. And it's failed, and it will always fail as long as you have these Mandarins in control. We're killing American boys to keep them in power. And that's why you've got to set up a different form of government in Southeast Asia if you're ever going to bring economic freedom to the mass of the people. A major issue, and then the other one, and this happens all the time in every race. Uh, well, how much, uh, are you performing well for our state? It's a, you, 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 hate to, you hate to think that that's what politics is re reduced to, but you remember what Tip O'Neill said about all politics is local. And was Senator Morris performing for our state? Now forget his position on Vietnam, for or against, or forget his position, uh, could he deliver for the state? And, and, you, and you knew that would be an issue. I knew it would be an issue I would raise. I got this piece at his headquarters before they knew who I was. I can't get any more now. <laughs> you add up everything Oregon gets, dams and reclamation projects and research grants, and here's what the senator says. For every dollar Oregon pays in federal taxes, we receive a dollar and 50 cents in return. That's right. But every state in the West gets more from the federal government than the federal government taxes here, and every state in the East pays more in taxes than the federal government spends. The basic reason's public lands. When Senator Morris went to the Senate in 1944, we were third from the top of all of the states in the West when you compared what we got as opposed to what the federal government taxed. Today it's 1968, 24 years of Senator Morris later, and we're last. Oregon gets $1.50, California $1.63, Washington $1.83, Idaho $1.93, Nevada $2.03, Utah $2.86, Montana $3.01, Arizona $3.15, and Alaska $7.33. We can't afford any more seniority. It, it, was a, it was a telling point in the debate, and it was a great temptation to want to use that earlier in the debate, because we had earlier in the campaign, we had the information for several months. And we just thought, no, just sit on this. A time is going to come when you want to use this in an explosive way, and, and indeed the debate was over. May I say good naturedly, you just had an illustration of the difference between our campaign. The office I hold belongs to you, and I do not intend to drag it through the gutter of ad hominem attack, which has been the basis, of course, of my opponent's campaign. And he's just demonstrated it in the misrepresentation of the statistics that he's given. Let me, let me, and you can tell by the response of the crowd to the answers that, that we had done well. There's, there's no question that in the debate, he was not the tiger that he had been in the past for whatever reason. It, it's, it's, it's almost... It's almost as if he took me too lightly and did not spend the time preparing uh, that I'd spent preparing, and especially those crisp answers that you were going to be forced to by the rules that had been agreed upon. The debate was 10 days before the election. We'd bought as much television time as we could for the remainder of the election in half-hour blocks and just ran the questions and answers. He could have survived that debate, perhaps, but it was a combination, and the... Uh, multiplication of other things that tended to create, I guess, uh, the final the final vote. Now, bear in mind, Senator Packwood didn't win that election all that big. It was what? A few hand, handful of votes out of the total. So you know that he had to start way back behind the goalposts and keep a momentum down that field until he was able to edge out, edge out Senator Morse by a handful of votes. It was the voting intent of a majority of Oregon voters to elect Robert Packwood to the United States Senate. I congratulate him on his opportunity to serve the wonderful people of Oregon in the United States Senate. He called me two or three times after that from his home in Washington because he and Mrs. Moore stayed in the district uh, asking me questions that um, had to do with the timber industry in which he was interested, and I was very interested. 
and I suggested that he come to my office and he said that no, he did not want to come back to the hill after his defeat and uh, indicated that he was going to run again when Senator Packwood's term was up. I'm very optimistic. I've been all over the state. I've received a wonderful reception. It's been a great shift of opinion since 1968. Many, many people that voted against me urged me to run, stop me and tell me I'm going to vote for you. I think that it shows what's going on at the grassroots of this country. It's important for all of us to know when to quit in politics. I was never very good at quitting at the ahead of the game, but uh, I expected of other people, and I admire people who know that there is some limit to public toleration. They do sometimes get tired of people. We thought he looked rather uh, feeble at times because we would have you know joint appearances with him, and sometimes he could hardly get up and walk up to the stage. But it, it was still a surprise, of course. We didn't think that he would run, run for office. He'd known for a long time that he had a, a fatal matter bothering him, and, uh, and, but he went right ahead. You wouldn't know it by the way he uh, kept himself busy. Come through that primary, and, uh, and people were just exhilarated. And then with, with his death uh, coming as such a such a surprise, uh, people really were crushed. Former Senator Wayne Morse of Oregon died the day of heart and kidney failure. The 73-year-old Morse became ill five days ago while campaigning for a political comeback. They tell the story about Morse, that during one of his campaigns a few years ago, a young boy approached him and said, well, I'll be Wayne Morse. My dad says Wayne Morse don't care nothing for politicians. He's for the people. Wayne Morse, dead today at 73. In the career of Wayne Morse, Eric Severide sees a quality missing from the national political scene today. Here is Eric's commentary. Former Senator Wayne Morse of Oregon was the last angry man of national politics. It is wrath, righteous wrath, over the long train of abuses by men who held a high power, wrath over the gutter tone of the political dialogue, the very debasement of the common language by men who disguise and fill their emptiness with expletives, epithets, and invective. So the young have the notion that almost everybody is on the take, but they did not believe it Wayne Morris. And oh, what his past has taught us. His life reminds us that there are other lands of the free and the brave, and that patriotism isn't exclusively an American property. He told us that personal and national principles cannot be changed to accommodate your bank account or your political party or your friends or even your enemies. Compared to the real SOBs in Washington, he was a candidate for sainthood, although with feet of clay. All sorts of people in the state are influenced by him that would have no idea in the world who he was. And I think he'd be perfectly happy with that. He's just a forward-thinking person, completely serious, completely dedicated, and as ethical as you can imagine. And his life won't be seen again. Well, none of us are ever going to be that ethical again. We were too sleazy when we get right down to it.